The theme for this laboratory is linear algebra. You'll discover the syntax to create a new type of symbol to represent a vector. You'll apply the properties of vector algebra with basic operators like plus and minus sign. You'll use specialised functions associated with vector algebra and you'll render vectors and vector expressions visually. In the bottom left hand corner of the command bar there's a pull down menu providing vectors and matrices with different dimensions. Hovering over each icon reveals the number of rows and columns. Note that each placeholder contains two numbers. The first number is the row dimension and the second is the column dimension. So the elements of vectors and matrices are always entered in row column order. Now most of the activities we'll be involved with will involve two or three dimensional vectors. Therefore after we've used the command bar once it's usually just quicker to copy and paste an existing vector and then change the vector elements of the copy. If you're observant, you'll notice that square brackets are used to specify the row and column dimensions, although you do not need to do this from first principles unless you want to. So when we want to do linear algebra, then we're going to use some of the functions in a special library called linalg, and here's the first of those functions called transpose. And if we want to find out what's going to happen with this particular syntax, we can just select the text and then hit function key 1 and it'll fire up the online documentation on the related page. But of course we can guess what's going to happen here. We're going to take the result of the last computation, which was a row vector, and transpose it. And if we repeat that syntax, then we can transpose it yet again. So these functions that are available to do linear algebra will be revealed incrementally over the course of this laboratory session. The full list of library functions can be found by typing info with an argument of linalg. In this first example, there are three variables called P, Q and R. They are defined to be vectors and initialized with numeric values. The vectors are then used in a vector equation where the vector P and the product of the scalar S with the vector Q are added and the result is then assigned to the vector R. Note that we're using the standard operators intuitively. For example, the plus operator adds vectors. A lot of vector algebra simply involves the use of standard operators. Now the final statement demonstrates yet another example of the use of the function solve. Here the first argument is a vector equation and the second argument is the unknown scalar s. The function then computes the value for the scalar. Finally as a check we substitute the scalar value back into the vector equation. Since linear algebra focuses on vector spaces and linear mappings between spaces, it's often helpful to visualize the vectors within a problem. We have a huge repertoire of visual objects that might, we might render, so for vectors we normally select the 2D and 3D arrows. Now in this example we begin by defining three variables a1, a2 and a3 which all equate to visual objects which are specified to be 2D arrows 
this is the appropriate shape for a vector. The first argument is one of the three vectors we defined earlier, PQRR, and this provides the start and end points for the drawing of that particular vector. And in order to distinguish between the three vectors, we've defined unique attributes for each of the arrows. We've added a colour and a legend. Those three objects are then passed as arguments to the plot function, and when it's drawn we can see quite clearly which arrow is which arrow by virtue of the colour. Now the decoupling of the data from the function that plots the data is an example of object orientation and is considered to be best practice in the theory of software engineering. Now that's, a th that's an assertion that will be defended later on in the degree programme, but for now just accept that if we placed all four lines of text into a single statement, it would be much harder for you to read and understand. This next example is pretty similar to the previous one. Here we got two vector equations and we know that one is valid and one is not. So when we pass the equation to the solve function, we find for the first equation it returns a proper numerical result, in other words it's valid. For the second equation, the solve function returns an empty set which tells us it could find no answer, therefore that equation is not valid. And finally we just render the three vectors described in the question. This next example demonstrates that it's easy to create vector expressions using the basic operators plus, minus, multiply, divide and brackets. And then when we compute the results it's easy to render the results visually. In this example we have two vector equations and two unknown scalars a and b and we'd like to find values for a and b. Yet again we invoke the function solve but notice this time we've provided two equations within square brackets for the first argument. The combination of equations allows us to find the unknown scalar either a or b. For this example, we move on to 3D vectors. Hence, we'll use the visual object arrow 3D with vectors of size 3. The visualization gives us an insight into whether the assertion about the sum of the vectors bisecting the angle between the two individual vectors is true. If we select the rendered diagram, we can move it around and from observation it looks quite likely that it's true but of course it's only an observation we need to validate that with some proper numbers. So now we see a utility function called norm and the first argument is a vector and the second indicates that each of the vector elements should be squared. The square root of the sum of the squares is computed and therefore this gives us the magnitude of the vector and therefore we can return unit vectors based upon the original vector. Now we shall use another function from the linear algebra library. As you can deduce the function computes the scalar or dot product. So we provide two vectors as its arguments and the function is used within a larger expression to compute the angle between two vectors, so I'm sure you'll recognize the formula. Now remember that trig utility functions always use radian arguments, not degree values. Therefore it would be helpful for us to convert those radian values into degree values. But as you see, our answer remains symbolic even after the scaling has been performed. This is going to be one of those special occasions where we want the symbols, like pi, to be translated into number. And that's why we're using float. This can convert a symbolic expression into a natural number, and as we see it's close to 98 degrees. This requirement to compute the angle between two vectors is so common that the linear algebra library contains a function called angle, and therefore it's easier to use than what we did before. And if we find the angle between each of the vectors 
and the sum of the vectors, then we'll see that the answer is approximately half of 98. Here is another example that confirms that we get the same result whether we use the expression involving scalar product or we use the function called angle. So for this example we're aware of the significance of a zero value being returned from computing a scalar product. So if we put that into the argument placeholder for the function bool, we'll expect it to compute the scalar product and then bool will tell us whether it's equal to zero or not in the form of true-false answer. So when we invoke the code, we find that the answer is true. So therefore, the vectors u and v are indeed orthogonal and perpendicular. So the example then goes on to demonstrate the use of another of the linear algebra functions called cross product and of course that's a vector product and again we need to give it two vectors as its input arguments and it's going to return a result to a variable we've called perp and that's shown down here as these three values and then the final step is to take the first element minus six and divide through that answer so that we get it into a format that we would like. So this notation of square brackets and what's called an index value, for this particular example we have three numbers and they're indexed with values either 1 or 2 or 3. But here we're using the index value 1 because we want the first element of that answer. The next two examples are just a variation on the theme of the last example, except this time we've added a check just to make sure that the vector that we generated from cross product is truly perpendicular to both u and v. And as the output shows, that's the case there. And when we do this for the next example, then again it confirms that the generated vector is perpendicular to the two original vectors. The penultimate example here demonstrates that the combination of standard operators like plus or minus and some functions like utility function norm to calculate the magnitude of a vector or the linear algebra functions like scalar product and cross product, all of these things in combination will enable you to solve many problems in linear algebra. And the final example this simply demonstrates that quite often those concepts from linear algebra are combined. And whilst it's not difficult to calculate a scalar product or a vector product, it is also very easy to introduce numerical errors. So when you're doing pen and paper activities, don't forget that you can validate your results really easily and therefore have confidence in what you're doing.